Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton, and this is Geopolitical Economy Report. I've done a lot of reporting here about the coup in Peru in December 2022. It was a U.S.-backed parliamentary coup against the democratically elected left-wing president, Pedro Castillo. Castillo was overthrown, and then he was imprisoned for 18 months without trial, without due process. There have been massive protests going on in the South American country since the coup, and in just over a month, the U.S.-backed unelected coup regime has killed around 50 protesters. It, it's been extremely bloody. There have been huge protests going on. You know, basically large parts of the country have been in chaos for over a month. And the U.S. government has strongly supported this coup. I will link in the description below an interview that I did with a Peruvian activist on the ground talking about the coup and the protests and all of that. What I'm going to focus on today are Peru's very strategic natural resources, the massive mineral reserves it has, and also the large gas reserves that it has, and U.S. interest and the interest that foreign multinational corporations have in exploiting these very plentiful natural resources in Peru. The U.S. ambassador in Peru is named Lisa Kenna, and she's a CIA veteran. And you know what they say about the CIA? There's no such thing as a former CIA agent. She, on paper, she worked for the CIA for nine years. That information was disclosed by the U.S. State Department. In the description below, I will link to a report I did that has all of the sources showing her involvement with the CIA. And I, I did another video and podcast about that. And... Immediately, right before the coup, one day before the coup, the coup happened on December 7th, so on December 6th, the U.S. Ambassador Lisa Kenna met with Peru's defense minister, and the next day, the day of the congressional coup, he told the military to disobey the orders of the elected president, Pedro Castillo, and then they, impris they imprisoned him, launching this coup. The defense minister who met with the U.S. Ambassador absurdly accused Pedro Castillo of the one trying to launch a coup. For people who are more interested in those details about his attempt to dissolve the Congress constitutionally and hold new elections and a constitutional referendum, check out the interview that I did in the description below with a Peruvian activist. We talk about all of those misleading claims. But I want to talk now about another meeting that the U.S. ambassador held with the coup regime. On January 18th, the CIA veteran Lisa Kenna sat down with the Minister of Energy and Mines of Peru, as well as the Vice Minister of Hydrocarbons and the Vice Minister of Mines, to talk about ways to increase foreign corporate investment in Peru, to expand its extractive industries, and develop the gas sector and mining. So... This clearly is a significant factor behind U.S. Machiavellian meddling in Peru. Peru has become a major resource hub for foreign corporations. It is one of the world's largest producers of copper, along with Chile. And copper was a reason for the famous 1973 coup organized by the CIA against Chile's socialist president, Salvador Allende, who... Na had nationalized the copper and wanted to prevent foreign corporations from exploiting Chile's copper. And also, in addition to the copper, uh, Peru has very large reserves of gold and zinc and silver and lead and also iron. And I mentioned that Peru is one of Latin America's largest producers of gas. And in fact, in 2022, it's not a coincidence that Peru... It's liquefied natural gas, LNG exports, shifted from Asia to Europe. And Europe began to import the vast majority of Peru's liquefied natural gas. And why is that? Because Europe was boycotting Russian energy. So the, the Peru coup against the left-wing president Pedro Castillo happens in the middle of all this geopolitical intrigue, the fight for control of mineral reserves, of natural gas, and minerals are going to be increasingly important, especially as the world moves toward renewable energy, which obviously is important and necessary to fight climate change. But at the same time, we need to ask where are those minerals going to come from to build the renewable energy technologies. They're going to come from Latin America 
and specifically the countries of Peru, Bolivia, Chile, also Argentina and Brazil. But Bolivia has the world's largest lithium reserves. There's also some in Peru and Chile. Chile and Peru have the world's largest copper reserves. And more and more, we're hearing a, a popular term that lithium is the new white gold. Well, copper is also the new oil. That is according to Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs published a briefing in 2022 in which they said copper is the new oil. And they said the critical role copper will play in achieving the Paris climate goals cannot be overstated. As the most cost effective conductive material, copper sits at the heart of capturing, storing and transporting these new sources of renewable energy. And again, I want to repeat, Chile and also Peru have some of the world's largest copper reserves. So you can bet that this is a significant factor in the US backed coup in Peru against the elected president, Pedro Castillo. Now, as always, all of the sources that I mentioned today in this analysis will be linked to in an article in the description below. You can go check it out at geopoliticaleconomy.com. And I want to start looking at who Pedro Castillo was, because people probably might know if they know the basics about Peru. This was the first left wing president of Peru in many decades since the 1970s. He is a labor organizer and a teacher and a farmer from a poor rural area. And Pedro Castillo ran for president in 2021 as a minor candidate. Very few people thought he would win, but he became a prominent figure because he led a teacher strike and he had the, he had the, the backing of poor and working class Peruvians, especially those of indigenous descent. And this is the kind of rhetoric he used during his presidential campaign. And you can see that it was very left wing and very antagonistic toward foreign corporations. He said this is this is a tweet that he wrote just several weeks before the presidential elections in 2021. He said, let's be clear, these decades of betrayal, corruption and cynicism are the symptoms of this neoliberal system dedicated exclusively to the exploitation of our people and our resources for the benefit of a few scoundrels. So he's criticizing the past right wing governments for exploiting the natural resources of the country and allowing them to be to go into the pockets of a small hand handful of oligarchs. And during the campaign as well, this is an article in La Repubblica, which is a major newspaper in Peru. During his campaign, he also called for renegotiating the contracts that private companies had with Peru in order to force these companies to pay more taxes so that 70 percent of all of the proceeds of the mining sector in Peru would go to the state. And then he pledged to use that money in order to fund health care, education and poverty reduction programs. So it's very clear what Pedro Castillo's model was, what his his campaign was based on. It was pledging to renationalize natural resources so that they can go to benefit the majority of people in Peru. And when he was president, he repeatedly made this clear. He said that this is a tweet from the presidency, the presidential office in Peru in February 2022. He said, today we are rescuing the resources of the country for all Peruvians. And this is part of his project that he referred to as the second um, agrarian reform. So he was trying to have land reform and help poor people and challenge the control that big foreign corporations had, the chokehold that they had over Peru's natural resources. Now, fast forward to today and we see the exact opposite. We see that the coup regime has re-implemented a neoliberal economic program. And whereas Pedro Castillo pledged that he was going to use the natural resources to benefit the Peruvian people and in order to fund local industry to develop the local economy. Instead, we've seen that the coup regime has re reverted to a neoliberal economic model based on exports of low value added commodities of raw materials. And these are the tweets from the Peruvian Ministry of Energy and Mines showing the CIA officer turned U.S. Ambassador Lisa Kenna meeting with the 
Minister of Energy and Mines, Oscar Vera Garguervich, Garguerovich. And in, in this, they said it was a, a high level institutional dialogue between Peru and the United States that addressed themes of development of the mining sector. And in follow up tweets, again, this is from January 18th, the Peruvian coup regime wrote that the U.S. ambassador also met with the vice minister of hydrocarbons, who oversees natural gas, and the vice minister of mines. And they addressed themes linked to the expansion of natural gas and mining investments. And the minister of energy and mines said that he thanked the support. He was grateful for the support of the North American government in terms of mining and energy issues, and he re reiterated the will of the coup regime, whose priority is the expansion of natural gas, energy security, and petrochemical development of the south of the country. So this shows the, the differences between these models. Pedro Castillo was trying to implement a progressive economic model known as import substitution industrialization. He wanted to make Peru more economically sovereign to increase domestic consumption, internal use of gas. And instead of just simply relying on exporting raw materials, wanted to add to have value added to that process in order to develop Peruvian industry. And in fact, in order to do that, Pedro Castillo was working with the new left wing president in Colombia, Gustavo Petro, and Colombia also has a significant uh, oil and gas sector, which is a large part of its exports. And Peru under Castillo and Colombia under Petro were trying to work together to develop each other's countries instead of just relying on foreign corporations to exploit the natural resources in Peru. But the reality is that we've seen a return to the neoliberal model. And I wanna talk a little bit more about these foreign corporations that are exploiting Peru. And in order to understand that, we have to look at some of the most recent statistics from the Peruvian government. I went through the most recent reports from the Peruvian Ministry of Energy and Mines, and their most recent statistics were from November 2022. And they showed that in their statistics that the mining sector represents nearly 60% of all of Peru's exports. And the top exports include especially copper and gold, but they also export, in addition to copper and gold, zinc, silver, lead, iron, also molybdenum. And according to the Peruvian government statistics, copper, gold, zinc, and iron represented 88.4% of the total value of mineral exports. And there's a, a chart here showing that, again, the majority of exports in Peru are made up by, by um, mining. And who are the largest companies operating in the mining sector in Peru? The biggest company operating in the mining sector in 2022 was the company Anglo American. And I know that might sound fake, but yes, I know and that might sound like it's just too on the nose, but yes, in 2022, according to proving government statistics, the largest foreign investor in Peru's mining sector is a UK based company literally called Anglo American. <laughs> and this is a company, a mining company that is also involved in in Australia, Ch um, Chile, South Africa, Brazil. So, um, you know, that says a lot about the second biggest corporate investor in Peru's mining sector is a local company called Compañía Minera Andamina. But that even though it's technically an a Peruvian company, it's owned by foreign corporations and specifically the two of the world's largest oil, uh, largest mining corporations are the majority shareholders of together. They they each have a third of the shares in this Peruvian company. Now, I went through another document that the Peruvian Ministry of Mining published in 2018, and it boasted that the world's three largest mining corporations are active in Peru, and that includes BHP Group, which is from Australia, Rio Tinto, which is from Britain and Australia, and also Glencore, which is from Switzerland. 
And the Peruvian Ministry of Mining wrote in 2018, quote, the world's most important companies in the mining sector are making investments in our country. Due to our mineral reserves, Peru is a market that is always taken into account by these companies when they decide their investment budgets and exploration and exploitation. And back in 2018, when the, these other statistics were published, the second largest mining investor in Peru was this company I mentioned, the Compañía Minera Antamina, which is still the second largest today. And it's 34% owned by BHP, 34% owned by Glencore, 22% uh, owned by a Canadian company called Tech Resources, and 10% owned by Japan's Mitsubishi. Now, I should point out that these massive mining conglomerates are companies that have you know, uh, revenues of tens of billions of dollars. BHP and Rio Tinto, each around, each of them have around $60 billion in revenue per year. And Glencore, which is not only involved in mining, but also in commodities trading, they have revenue of around $200 billion a year. Meanwhile, Peru is a cash cow for these companies, including BHP. Peru was the source for 20% of all of BHP's global production of copper in 2017 and 50% of its global production of silver and 100% of BHP's global production of zinc. And Peru in 2017 was the source of 15% of Rio Tinto's global production of copper. So again, I want to stress this point that Peru is extremely rich in natural resources and minerals, especially copper. And there's there are other companies that are active in, in uh, extracting um, minerals and mining in Peru include the U.S. company Freeport McMoran, also the Mexican company Southern Copper Corporation. Both of those companies, by the way, are based in Phoenix, Arizona. And also there's a Canadian company called Barrick Gold, which is involved in mining. And those are just companies that are involved in investing in current mining projects, but then there are also are large exploration projects going on across Peru because it has so many minerals. And there's a, an interesting map that was published by the Ministry of Energy and Mines. I went through their most recent reports, and this is a report they published that is from 2022. And it shows the companies that are responsible for the majority of their companies investing in mining exploration projects in Peru. And Canada is the largest with 28% of the investment. And then Brazil is the second largest with 13%, followed by Switzerland, and then Britain, and then the United States, Japan, and Australia. And technically Peruvian companies invest 38% in mining exploration projects, but that figure can be misleading because many of those local Peruvian companies are actually owned by foreign mining corporations. Like I mentioned, the second largest company that is active in mining in Peru today, which is the Compañía Minera Altamina, that company is technically Peruvian and it's the second largest involved in the mining sector, but it's owned by Australian, Swiss, Canadian, and Japanese companies. And in terms of the mining exploration projects, 43% of them are looking for gold and 36% of them are looking for copper. 11% are looking for zinc. 8% are looking for silver and 1% are looking is one looking for tin. And there's a map that was published in this report from the Ministry of Energy and Mines. And you can see how, how all across Western Peru, there are hundreds of mining exploration projects all over the country. So this is obviously something that's very profitable. And given the importance, the increasing importance of mining for renewable energy technologies, you can bet that this is going to be something that's going to increase in the future. And I should mention, by the way, that in the uh, the tweets that were po posted by the Peruvian coup regime's Ministry of Energy and Mines, they talked about working with the U.S. government in order to develop renewable energy. So this is this is green colonialism. This is green imperialism. 
I mean, again, I want to stress this because I'm not downplaying how important it is to fight against climate change and, and ecocide and the destruction of the environment. Those are important things, but we need to keep in mind that this can also be used as an excuse to justify more imperialism and foreign conquest and exploitation. And this is exactly what we're seeing is green imperialism. Now, finally, I want to, and, and of course, uh, green imperialism was, was a factor behind the 2019 U.S.-backed coup against Bolivia's democratically elected socialist president, Evo Morales. And let's not forget that after that coup, uh, someone tweeted at Elon Musk, you know what wasn't the, in the best interest of the people? The U.S. government organizing a coup against Evo Morales in Bolivia so you could obtain the lithium there. And Elon Musk responded tweeting, we will coup whoever we want, deal with it. Now, of course, Tesla needs a lot of lithium for the batteries it has in its cars and also just in other technologies. So when Elon Musk said, I mean, when he admitted that this was a factor behind the coup in Bolivia in 2019, it was not a joke. He deleted that tweet later, but he was being very honest there. Now, let's also talk about another significant factor, which is related to the energy transition, which is liquefied natural gas. Now, I have a separate video and a podcast that I did about how the United States became the world's largest exporter of LNG, liquefied natural gas, tied with Qatar in 2022. And why is that? Because Europe is boycotting Russian energy. And that means that the US is making huge sums of money from selling very expensive LNG to Europe. And Europe instead is no longer buying much cheaper Russian oil and Russian pipeline gas. But what's less known is that Peru is also, along with Trinidad and Tobago, one of the largest exporters of LNG in Latin America and the Caribbean. And in 2002, Peru's LNG exports increased by a whopping 85% in the first eight months of 2022. And why is that? It's of course because Europe pledged to boycott much cheaper Russian energy. And this is an incredible graph that shows just how much, just how drastically Peru's exports of liquefied natural gas shifted in the past year. In 2021, the vast majority, nearly all of Peru's LNG exports went to Asia, primarily Japan, South Korea, and China. But at the end of 2021 and 2022, with the escalation of tensions between NATO and Russia in Ukraine, and then the, the European pledge to boycott Russian energy, we saw a complete shift. And then Peru began exporting the majority, the vast majority of its liquefied natural gas in, to Europe instead of to Asia. And in some months, like for instance, in April and May and August of 2022, all of Peru's LNG exports went to Europe. And what companies, by the way, are involved in overseeing Peru's LNG exports? They include the British company Shell, the US company Hunt Oil, Japan's Marobeni Corporation, and South Korea's SK Group. So those are the corporations that are also profiting from Peru's LNG exports to Europe. And the main European importers of Peruvian LNG were Britain and also Spain. And in order to reduce its trade with Russia, Spain increased its imports of LNG from the Americas, including the US, Peru, and Trinidad and Tobago, by 77% in 2022. Spain increased its imports of US LNG by 93% in 2022. And I should point out that ironically, because Spain was pledging to boycott Russian oil, it actually also increased its imports of more expensive Russian LNG by 37%. It's a hilarious irony there. And I should point out that from 2021 until mid-2022, the price of natural gas in the international market skyrocketed by 700%. So th those factors explain why the CIA officer turned U.S. ambassador to Peru, Lisa Kenna, is having these meetings with the Ministry of Energy and Mining in Peru with the coup regime. It's why they're discussing increasing foreign investment 
and expanding natural gas production and also expanding in investment in mining. It's very clear. And I'm not saying this is the only factor behind the coup in Peru. There are always multiple factors. There's never just one factor, but you can bet that this is a significant one, given that in Peru, more than 10% of the entire economy of the GDP comes from the mining sector. Nearly 60% of all na national exports come from the mining sector. And not only copper, also gold, silver, zinc, and of course, natural gas, which is becoming increasingly important. So keep an eye on this. I will be reporting, as always here at Geopolitical Economy Report, on the protests in Peru. As I said, around 50 protesters have been killed and those protests are continuing and they're actually growing more and more. They're not getting smaller. This is a video shared by an Argentine journalist showing thousands of indigenous Peruvians from the Aymara and Quechua communities marching all the way to Lima, the capital, in order to protest the coup regime. So this is going to be a factor going forward, not only in the next few months and years, but really for decades, as countries in South America like Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina, and also Brazil become increasingly important in the international economy and the transition toward renewable energy. I'm Ben Norton. If you want to support the work that we do here, you can go to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support, or you can go to patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy and become a patron. We have no big donors, no supporters. This is all completely independent. So if you enjoy our reporting and our analysis, please consider supporting us and I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.